Hello, patient partners. I'm Dr. Jun Ruiz, the lead for colorectal cancer screening on the Medical City. March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. We are again collaborating with the Department of Health for a forum called March Against Colon Cancer towards a universal cancer care beyond the pandemic. This year, we have four distinguished speakers, namely Dr. Beverly Rain Ho from the Department of Health, Professor and Gastroenterologist Dr. Jose Soliano Jr., Medical Oncologist Dr. Nessie Huat, and yours truly. Join us live on March 3, Friday at 9.30 a.m. on the Medical City official Facebook page. Scrap cancer now and see you at the webinar. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to March Against Colon Cancer towards a universal cancer care beyond the pandemic, a forum on colon cancer and National Integrated Cancer Control Act. Introducing the host of today's event, Dr. June Ruiz. Dr. June Ruiz is the Programs and Advocacy Officer of the Augusto P. Sarmiento Cancer Institute of the Medical City. He is a Philippine and American board certified gastroenterologist and the lead for colon cancer screening at the Medical City. Heading the Organization in Educational Patient Awareness Campaigns on Colorectal Cancer Screening. As a patient advocate, he has represented TMC as the authority promoting colorectal cancer screening on several television and radio programs over the years and moderated symposiums on important gastrointestinal diseases. He has worked in other health issues like COVID-19 and other cancers as well. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Jun R. Ruiz. Good morning, doctors, healthcare professionals, executives, our friends from the media, and our patient partners. Welcome to our webinar entitled March Against Colon Cancer Towards a Universal Cancer Care Approach for Filipinos Beyond the Pandemic. This is a webinar for our Colon Cancer Awareness Advocacy in support of the SCRAP Cancer Program of the Augusto P. Sarmiento Cancer Institute of the Medical City. I am Dr. June Ruiz, your moderator and one of the speakers for today's event. March is Colon Cancer Awareness Month. Colorectal cancer, or simply colon cancer, is the third most common cancer in the Philippines and in the rest of the world. Colon cancer ranks as the world's second cancer killer. In the post-pandemic Philippine setting, we will explore the strategies that are in place in our government to fight against cancer based on the mandate of the National Integrated Cancer Control Act or NICA that was approved way back in 2019. We will learn the latest consensus guidelines in screening Filipinos for colon cancer, truly a life-saving advocacy. Third, we will focus on the Medical City's very own scrap cancer program. Finally, we will watch the world premiere of our comprehensive educational video on colon cancer from its clinical presentation, diagnosis, and treatment. We have excellent speakers for today's forum, and we hope that you will learn and enjoy this educational experience. To give our welcome remarks is the director of Augusto P. Sarmiento Cancer Institute, Dr. Beatrice Chanco, and this will be followed by the head of section of the gastroenterology department, Dr. Carla Cibolo. Let us welcome Dr. Chanko and Dr. Cibolo. Good morning to all our cancer patients, advocates, and all our guest speakers. On behalf of the Augusto P. Sarmiento Cancer Institute of the Medical City, I invite you to march with us against colon cancer this entire March which is also the Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. Today, we have once again partnered with our friends from the Department of Health and colleagues from specialty societies who will speak in a forum titled Towards a Universal Cancer Care Beyond the Pandemic. 
As we are all aware, a lot of things have been happening beyond the four walls of this hospital, and we thank Dr. Jun Ruiz and his team for continuing to work hard to bring us all up to speed regarding our unified and all-of-nation approach to our battle against all cancers, especially colorectal cancer which is the third most commonly diagnosed and the fourth most common cause of cancer death in the Philippines today. Let us all find out together what we can do to join this march against colorectal cancer, today, this month, and always, until every preventable colon cancer is prevented through a healthy lifestyle, if not prevented, then detected early and cured through timely screening, and if not cured, then let us do what we can so that every colorectal cancer patient can have access to the best available treatment so that she or he can have the longest and best possible quality of life despite the cancer diagnosis. Thank you, good morning, and welcome everyone. A pleasant day to all of you. It has been four years since the World Health Organization declared the COVID-19 a pandemic, and we can remember vividly how that event changed and affected the life of every single person all over the world. Suddenly, the world, with all its progress and development, went to a halt. But during those times, one aspect of our life surfaced to the consciousness of most people and that is the value of health. Everyone wanted to be healthy and strong in order to fight off the virus. Health became the top priority. Fast forward to this day. Now that we have regained most of our freedom from the pandemic, the health consciousness still remains. And it is up to us healthcare providers to ride this wave and strengthen our efforts in promoting the optimal health care that each person deserves. But not only for COVID prevention, but also for other important diseases, including colon cancer, a disease which has also seen its rise in the number of cases as more people became aware of the value of colorectal cancer screening. So today, let us listen to our speakers talk about this disease and the different steps our leaders are taking as we join them in the March Against Colon Cancer. Once again, good morning everyone and enjoy our forum. Thank you for your inspiring messages, Dr. Chanko and Dr. Sibolo. We truly appreciate all the support. We have been celebrating our advocacy here at the Medical City together with the Department of Health since 2016. Undersecretary Dr. Eric Tayag is among our most popular speakers as he educates us with his informative lectures and delights us with his entertaining dance steps. Last year, we have Dr. Clarito Cairo as one of our speakers. This year, we have a promising young and bright physician leader joining our rosters of speakers from the DOH, whom I will introduce later on. Indeed, the DOH has been an institution partner of this medical city in this advocacy over the years. To give the opening message from the Department of Health is the officer in charge, Dr. Maria Rosario S. Vergere. A pleasant morning to all of you. First of all, the Department of Health expresses its warmest gratitude and appreciation to the Medical City in convening this Forum on Colon Cancer and the National Integrated Cancer Care Act with the theme, March Against Colon Cancer Towards a Universal Cancer Care Beyond the Pandemic. We regard this type of collaboration with our partners as an opportunity to increase cancer literacy among the general public particularly with colorectal cancer. With cancer as the second leading cause of mortality in the Philippines and research showing that certain risk factors may increase a person's chance of developing cancer, addressing it remains a top concern for the country's healthcare system. Colorectal cancer is the fourth leading cause of cancer-related deaths among Filipinos. 
According to recent estimates, colon and rectal cancers rank third for both sexes in the Philippines. Both males and females begin to see a sharp increase in the incidence rates after age 50. And to help our fellow kababayans, we aim to detect cancer early because the earlier it is treated, the greater the chances of survival rate. We at the Department of Health believes that educating the public with regard to cancer is truly essential. To establish an effective cancer control program, increasing awareness, modifying risk behavior, learning self-examination skills, and promoting early cancer detection are all required. Makakaasa po kayo magpapatuloy ang kagawaran ng kalusugan sa pagtupad ng pangakong mas magiging abot kamay at mas mabilis ang magiging pagtugon natin sa mga pasyenteng may cancer. We will continue to work with you in ensuring that public awareness and people-centered care are in place for our kababayans with cancer. Inaasahan po namin ang patuloy nating pagtutulungan tungo sa pagtupad ng ating pangakong serbisyong pangkalusugan para sa bawat Pilipino sa ngalan ng universal health care. With that, maraming salamat po and together, let us all work together towards achieving a healthy and cancer-free Philippines. Thank you, Dr. Vergere, for the valuable support from the Department of Health. Colon cancer awareness had its beginnings in America in the year 2000. After a decade, the Philippines joined this crusade and the medical city was among the pioneer institutions that spearheaded this advocacy. The medical city has always been a champion in this advocacy for more than 10 years. We celebrate colon cancer awareness every year. Truly, it is a TMC tradition. In the beginning, we started in small lay forums. Then it grew to multidisciplinary symposiums, then joint activities with the DOH, and then a first of its kind joint international symposium with America's top HMO, Kaiser Permanente. Our forums had become national platforms for trailblazing public health issues like universal healthcare and NICA. Today, we at the Medical City are excited that our message has resonated with many professional societies, hospitals, and patient support groups throughout the Philippines, and they have been promoting this worthy cause as well. This premiere of the 2023 Journey video highlights our beginnings, our growth, and achievements of the Medical City Colon Cancer Awareness Advocacy. Let the camera roll. Colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer in the world and in the Philippines. But with good screening programs and with highly specialized services, colorectal cancer is one of the most preventable and curable of cancers. For those reasons and with those objectives, TMC established its colorectal cancer screening program as well as its highly specialized colorectal clinic, which includes the stoma clinic and its enhanced recovery after surgery program. the lead 
for colon cancer screening advocacy since 2015, we organize projects, symposiums, and forums to spread this life-saving advocacy of screening among Filipinos to a much bigger audience. A first for this advocacy, three specialty sections of the medical city join forces to promote this cause among the doctors and our patient partners. We were the first in the private sector to collaborate with the Department of Health and then internationally with America's top HMO, Kaiser Permanente, in promoting colon cancer awareness in our celebrations and campaigns. Here at the TMC APSI, we have recently launched an organized cancer screening and prevention program, which we call Scrap Cancer Program, where we plan to go to our surrounding communities and teach and train barangay health workers and other stakeholders on the value of recognizing the early warning signs of cancer and of seeking health advice early on or on a regular basis once one reaches the age of risk. Colorectal cancer is screenable and preventable and this will certainly be included in our public health initiatives and programs like scrap cancer. Colorectal cancer is preventable, treatable, beatable. If you or your loved ones are at risk for colorectal cancer, visit us at the Medical City. Talk to one of our doctors about the screening process. What a journey! It has been. This advocacy would not have been successful were it not for the big support from Dr. Manuel Rojas, Dr. Beatriz Chanco, and Dr. Eugene Ramos. We will have three speakers for our first part of our forum, and this will be followed by a joint question and answer session that will be held at the end of the last talk. Our final lecture will be the comprehensive video lecture on colon cancer, specially made for you, our patient partners. For our viewers on Facebook, you can write your questions in the comments section. Four years ago, NICA was enacted into law. This landmark bill emphasizes cancer prevention and aims to make cancer services from primary screening all the way to treatment and palliative care more accessible to Filipinos. But then, COVID-19 came. Looking into the future beyond this pandemic, we are excited to listen how the DOH will implement the provisions mandated by NICA. I am also excited to hear what the plans of the National Colorectal Cancer Screening Program of the DOH. Our first speaker is Dr. Beverly Lorraine Ho. She is the Assistant Secretary of the Public Health Services Team and the Concurrent Director of the Health Promotion Bureau of the DOH. She also oversees the Disease Prevention and Control Bureau as well as the Epidemiology Bureau. And as HPB Director, she leads the implementation of policies and programs that promote healthy behaviors and support conducive environments for health. She holds a medicine degree from the University of the Philippines and 
an MPH in Health Policy and Management in the Harvard School of Public Health as a Fulbright Scholar. Let us all welcome Dr. Beverly Lorraine Ho. Good day everyone to our colleagues in the Medical City. Magandang araw po sa inyong lahat and thank you to the organizers of today's conference, especially Dr. June Ruiz for this invitation to have us share some of our updates regarding UHC progress as well as the NICA law updates no? as it pertains to colorectal cancer. I'm Beverly Ho and I'm from the Department of Health. Well, we all know that colorectal cancer ranks third in terms of incidence worldwide of the most common cancers. And it is also the second most common cause of cancer deaths globally. In the Philippines, it ranks number three in terms of new cases as of our 2020 data affecting both sexes and people of all ages. It is the fourth most common cause of cancer deaths in the Philippines. With that, it is clear to us that we have to provide services across the entire continuum of care for our patients. So typically, we know that your vision of a cancer patient would definitely be those who will um, require high levels of care. So in these slides, we show you the different cancer specialty centers that are currently being built in the entire country. And so the overall direction for this is to make sure that we build on existing facilities and not build something from zero no, or from ground up altogether because that will take of course um, so much more time. As you can see here on screen we have 11 advanced comprehensive centers and 13 basic comprehensive centers and at the top we have the Philippine Cancer Center which was conceptualized no, through the National Integrated Cancer Control Act. And we now have a small team starting to build up our Philippine Cancer Center. Now, through the National Integrated Cancer Control Act of 2019, this has enabled us to improve our cancer service delivery, such as increasing access to cancer medicines and providing treatment support. Through the NICCA as well, of course, it's going to be very important that in all of our expansion, we go by evidence-based um, standards development. Here on screen, you will see that in 2020, we have two. In 2021, we had six. And ongoing in 2022, we have another six CPGs that are being developed, funded through the National Integrated Cancer Control Program. Out of the 31 that the DOH has awarded, groups to make CPGs for seven of these were cancer related. So you can see all the names of the different cancers that we have CPGs for. No? And in fact, in 2021, that's when our colorectal cancer CPG was actually developed and approved. As part also of our work, definitely the CPGs would form the disease-specific evidence-based um, guidelines that we have. But we're also very much aware that it's not only CPGs that we need, but also other forms of job aids no, or tools that our healthcare providers at the front lines will need. So for example, the omnibus guidelines for child, adolescent, adult, and elderly population already summarizes all the necessary health promotion and disease prevention activities required no, for our most common high burden diseases, which would include cancers. So for example, for breast cancer, the needed screening modalities or even vaccination required for protection against certain cancers like hepatocellular cancer, that's HPV vaccination, or even HPV no, are indicated in our omnibus guidelines. So this is like your one-stop shop depending on the type of patient that you're seeing. No? And we hope to be able to update these omnibus guidelines every year. No? So we encourage our medical societies, our professional organizations, and even academic institutions to provide us with the necessary materials. We will review it and every year we may include it in updates of the omnibus guidelines. And finally, the life stage-based algorithms or specifically periodic health examination. 
So this is the latest of the initiatives of the DOH in order to further evidence-based practice. And specifically in this PHEX, no, we talk about or we provide recommendations to um, our primary care practitioners, not necessarily oncologists, on what types of screening exams are they supposed to give for certain population groups. No? So our PHEX has an accompanying app no, or a web-based application wherein you just put the age, sex, risk factors of your patients and it will automatically recommend to you which types of screening yung kailangan nila. So as mentioned, no, we already have our NCPG for colorectal cancer. Apart from the improved cancer care infrastructure, which we have talked about, we want to be able to make sure that um, these facilities would actually have the services, infra, equipment, and HRH that they will actually need. No? So makita niyo po no, in this slide that some of the ongoing cancer centers still lack no, certain equipment. And these are part of the development plan that we would be having in the next couple of years to make sure that by 2025, these facilities that you see on screen will actually have a full range of equipment already. So we also recognize that the program cannot do everything on its own. No? And part of the reason why we're here today is really to celebrate partnerships like what we have with the Medical City. We recognize that it's a lot of healthcare practitioners, civil society organizations, and even patient groups no, who will actually help us continuously improve our program. So there are many projects that we have developed alongside our partners. So for example, we have childhood cancer, health promotion, registry, financing, screening, and research-related um, projects with WHO, for example, as well as other private institutions. So at the end of the day, what is also clear to us is that we need to improve the capacities no, of our providers, our frontline providers. And so in the past, what used to be trainings that are provided by the Department of Health would definitely just be around cervical cancer or the VIA screening and um, some other trainings offered by different cancer institutions. However, we have worked with many of our partners in recent years, and what you see now on screen are the different curricula that are now available. So for example, there's cancer competency curriculum for uh, health workers, development of palliative care manual and procedures and standards, capacity building on CSMAP and the CAF information system, training on leadership and capacity building for cancer control with UP Open University and the patient navigation training program, which is being managed by the Philippine Cancer Society. So we also do have our Cancer and Supportive Palliative Medicines Access Program or CSP map, which provides access to free medicines not covered by PhilHealth. No? So on screen, you will see our Cancer and Supportive Palliative Medicines Access Program. The 20 sites currently receive funds, but in the remaining 11 sites receive some funding support, but largely in-kind medicines. So finally, here we also show you that part of the eight focus cancers that we are providing CSMAP access program for will be colorectal and other digestive tract cancers on top of the others here. We also show you at the bottom of this screen that the new cancer cases as of our 2020 data is around 150,000. But the enrolled patients in our different sites are only around 15,000. No? So clearly what this is just telling us is that the funds that we have and the number of enrolled patients definitely you know, cannot cover the entire population of cancer patients in the country. And this just means that we have to definitely work harder with our legislators to lobby for more funding for this. But the graph here also shows you how significantly the budget has already increased. And in fact, it's already at almost a billion pesos this year in 2020. Finally, the Cancer Assistance Fund, which was also legislated by our Congress and Senators, provides assistance by funding cancer control services, 
not medicines uh, specifically. So this could be diagnostics, therapeutics, procedures, treatment, and cancer medicines. And these are definitely you know, for beneficiaries of our program. You can zoom out and look at what do we want to do for the general population. No? So very clearly under the UHC Act, there's a very strong emphasis on the need for health promotion and disease prevention. And it's recognizing that hindi mauubos nor hindi enough yung resources natin if everyone will progress, if everyone's diseases will progress to the point that it will be very, very expensive to treat them. And this is why there's a huge part of our work that goes into health literacy. And we have campaigns such as Health is Life, um, which promotes the healthy behaviors through our seven priority areas encompassing diet and exercise, for example, getting vaccinated, avoiding substance abuse, and others. So, um, we also have another campaign called Consultayo. And under Consultayo, the idea here is to make sure that every Filipino knows the value of their primary care provider. In the Philippines, it's not so much um, a norm no, for us to have a primary care provider or a family physician or a family care provider. Mas sanay tayo na if you have resources, you go directly to a specialist. No? But essentially, every developed nation no, has a very good primary care system. And we know that this is really the way to go to make sure that people are taken care of when they're still healthy and their risks are being reduced. No? So with this, under our Consultayo campaign, there are a few diseases or disease groups that are considered priority, and cancer is definitely one of them. Um, so Taralab is also one of the campaigns that um, WHO has helped us uh, produce. So what is the difference between old-style health literacy work with current directions? No? What is clear to us is that it's not enough no, that we teach people or we tell them um, this is how you should live a healthier lifestyle, do X, Y, Z. Globally, the evidence has been pointing to making sure that environments no, where people live, work, grow, and play are actually conducive. And this is why apart from all of these health literacy initiatives that we have, we want to make sure that communities, schools, and workplaces are healthy. So what does this mean? When we talk about healthy communities, it means that don't have just these items in the green box, no? which is good services, good clinics, a working hospital. No? But essentially, these other things on the left-hand side should be available. And for many of you, alam niyo no? that these things on the left-hand side, potable water, um, good food, no? will all contribute to healthier lifestyle, less stress, etc., etc., which means also reducing overall risk no, for just not just cancers but other forms of diseases. At the same time, we also want to penetrate schools diba? because all of us build our healthy habits from when we are young. No? So our exposure in the school to certain vices, certain substances, or even unhealthy lifestyle will be dependent on how much we are able to modify our behavior since we're young. However, we do understand that when we talk about healthy schools, the typical response would then be, ah, sige, isama natin sa curriculum. And what, what we have been observing from various um, evidence abroad is that in order to make a healthy new generation, it's not just adding more things to their curriculum, but making sure that the school no, has healthy school policies, a good physical environment. If we want them to, to move around, then we have to allot time for play and we also have to allot some space for play. We have to have good social school environment. There has to be good links with parents and definitely a working school clinic. No? But what it's saying is that it's just not enough to have a working school clinic and a good curriculum. Yeah. Then finally, it's about workplaces as well. No? So the National Integrated Cancer Control Act also uh, mandates us to have good working uh, programs within our workplaces. And soon we will be releasing our guidelines with the Civil Service Commission and the Department of Labor and Employment about better 
policies and practices within workplaces, which would also include definitely our hospitals. No? And it's not just about well-being. There are also access to services within workplaces and, of course, occupational safety and health, which are still baseline requirements for our workplaces. So finally, we'd also like to let everyone know of our healthyfilipinas.ph website. So this is the one-stop shop website that we hope every Filipino would go into in order to get information about healthy behaviors, more, most common diseases, and what they can do about it. Of course, in laymanized terminologies that they will be able to easily understand and digest. And we were fortunate to have the support of USAID and PHAP in order to develop this. So we encourage all our partners here today, kindly share, submit resources that you may have, that you have asked your fellows, residents, or students to develop. And we can post it here so that other healthcare providers or patients may be able to download them and use them. So with that, maraming salamat po for your kind attention. Rest assured that we at the DOH are committed to continue to strengthen our health systems by making sure that we are able to help all of us set up standards for good screening services as well as treatment, but as well continue to expand access to the services that we can provide through our DOH hospitals, our cancer specialty centers, but also even through our private providers, of course, with the aid of PhilHealth reimbursement. So maraming salamat po and let us all continue to work towards making sure that cancer remains at the top of the health agenda, not just of DOH, but of course, even of our legislators and the rest of the government. So thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Ho, for such a comprehensive discussion on the DOH plans in realizing the objectives of NICA in battling cancer in our country. Due to increasing incidence of colon cancer in persons younger than 50, and after a review of the American scientific data, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force changed its recommendation in 2021 to begin screening average risk persons for colon cancer from age 50 to 45. At that time, a lot of our physicians, local gastroenterologists included, had pushed to adopt the earlier screening of the age 45. Let us remember these facts. Americans have a much higher risk for colon cancer than Filipinos. We also are a low resources country. Our next speaker shone bright last year in this forum with his impressive talk on this dilemma whether to start screening at the age 50 versus 45. Concluding, he said, without local data and lack of manpower resources in the Philippines, it may not be feasible to adopt this change in the Philippine setting. His analysis was validated by the third Asia-Pacific Consensus Recommendations on Colorectal Cancer just published last year. Let me introduce our next speaker. He's a very in-demand professor and a gastroenterology expert extraordinaire highly respected locally and internationally. He is a professor of medicine from the University of Santo Tomas Faculty of Medicine and Surgery, former president of the Philippine Society of Gastroenterology, Philippine Society of Digestive Endoscopy, the Hepatology Society of the Philippines, and the Philippine College of Physicians. He is also an active consultant from our section here at the Medical City. His achievements are too long to enumerate. It is indeed my honor and privilege to introduce Professor Jose Di Soliano.
Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And I am really happy to be here again in this Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month in March of every year. I am Jose Solano from the University of Santo Tomas and, of course, from the Medical City. And thanks very much to Dr. Jun Ruiz for this invitation because he is the forefront of this campaign for colorectal cancer awareness, not only in the hospital, but of course also in the entire country. As you will have seen the review of the latest uh, colorectal cancer global burden between 1990 and 2020, basically new cases of colorectal cancer more than doubled in the majority of countries that have been surveyed in this uh, global burden of disease study that was published in 2019. And deaths due to colorectal cancer have doubled in majority of the countries that have been reviewed, which includes the Philippines. And as you can see in the second line, the largest increases were experienced in countries with low and middle socio-demographic indices. And this is in contrast to the growing or the trend of lower incidence and mortality rates in the high-income countries, meaning, therefore, that in Asia, in Africa, for example, and even in South Asia and the Central Americas, these colorectal cancer incidence and mortality keeps rising. And, of course, in the Asia-Pacific region, we know that we contribute the largest burden of cases in colorectal cancer, both in incidence and, of course, in colorectal cancer-related mortality. In these line graphs, for example, you'll see that the males experience the greatest increases in colorectal cancer, both in incidents and, of course, in deaths in clearly on their life years. And even if you ACE standardize these rates, the males remain to be burdened by a higher and rising incidence of colorectal cancer compared to females. Here are some of the risk factors that are identified to be risk factors for the development of colorectal cancer. As you can see here, colorectal cancer is related to alcohol abuse, to data high and processed meat, high and red meat, for example, uh, low in calcium, which is, as you can see in the graphs, are a major factor of, you know, getting you colon cancer. And so therefore, maybe uh, supplementation of colon calcium every day once you are about 40, maybe it's a good recommendation. Diet low in fiber is also a risk factor. Low in milk, low in or in high calorie diets. You can see that there are many risk factors for colorectal cancer. And you can see again, uh, sedentary lifestyle and smoking. So if you're smoking, quit smoking, please. And of course, uh, exercise, because these are known risk factors that can be mitigated by a healthy lifestyle. This global graph of the distribution of colorectal cancer shows to us that in the Philippines, we are between 10 to 15 per 100,000 population this last two decades. And therefore, we can still bring this down. And hopefully that we become like one of those seen in color, light blue in, in America, of course, in the West. So we are here to campaign really for more awareness for colorectal cancer. And hopefully that we can entice you to get some screening tests in order for you to get early detection of the precancerous lesions that lead to cancer or maybe early detection of cancer because 60% of colon cancer deaths can be prevented with screening. And so today, June requested me to update you on the latest iteration of the Asia-Pacific Consensus on colorectal cancer, which was published only uh, very recently. In this new Asia-Pacific group of colorectal cancer screening, uh, they have basically looked at screening methods and preferred strategies, the modification of the age of starting and ending screening for colorectal cancer, especially in those patients with family history of colorectal cancer and those diagnosed with prior advanced adenoma, surveillance strategies for these patients with adenomas, and of course, renewed or increased awareness for this sessile serrated lesions, which I'll have a few slides on it. And of course, uh, emphasis on color quality assurance of screening programs, hopefully, that are being implemented by most countries, including the Philippines. We know that uh, in, in the Philippines, the DOH has already implemented a pilot for screening programs for colorectal cancer, and hopefully that they'll be able to roll this out nationwide soon. The first statement that was made by the Asia-Pacific Consensus was on the emphasis of risk stratification and, of course, sequential offering of tests, which are reasonable in approaches for colorectal screening in Asia. And here, they recommended to use a, a risk score 
There are many risk scores that are computed and promulgated by many regions in the world, but I think in Asia Pacific, the UK one in Singapore, together with us, have validated what we call as the Asia Pacific risk score for colorectal cancer. And this is really basically using simple demographics, family history, or other CRC risk factors for, for triaging which individuals might be needing a screening test or, or a colonoscopy. And here is the score, uh, the, the, the risk factors that you need to identify. You can compute this by yourself. And see, for example, AIDS, if you are older, if you are male, for example, if you have a family history for colorectal cancer, and if you are a smoker, that has a lot of numbers that are located on the right column. And if you total about two to three, you have a moderate risk of getting a colorectal cancer. And if you have a score of four to seven, you basically have a high risk for colorectal cancer incidence in the future. And therefore, you might like to subject yourself for a screening. The Asia-Pacific score has been validated in 15 countries, and the best way to apply this in the clinics is in patients who has a middle or higher score for, for this risk scoring system in Asia-Pacific, then you can tell them that there is a, as you can see here, about two to six or four to three-fold increase in prevalence of developing a polyp or a colorectal cancer, depending on your scores. And especially in combination with FIT, which is a fecal immunochemical test, these risk scores can actually detect up to 70% of polyps, especially adenomatous polyps, and 90% of colorectal cancers. And therefore, this can reduce colonoscopy demand in centers where there is not much colonoscopy services available. And you can identify which patients can really need colonoscopy and which patients might not need colonoscopy because of this risk scores plus an FIT stool test. Now, there are many tests that are, we know for colorectal cancer. We have spoken about the fecal immunochemical test. There is a source stool DNA test that's available, I think, locally as well as, of course, in America. Colonoscopy is there. Therefore, there's also CT scans and MRIs. Third, Asia-Pacific consensus recommended basically that quantitative fecal immunochemical test or a FIT test every year or every two years, or a colonoscopy every 10 years are the preferred screening tests in Asia. So these are some of the home kit that you can buy. In fact, if you go to the bigger centers now, when you request for a fit test, sometimes they send you the kit. Or if you are able to go to a reference lab, they can offer you a fit test right there and then. And clearly in those patients that are positive, then we need to do a colonoscopy. Or in those patients who find this test messy, then we can do a colonoscopy every 10 years. Or in my practice, I do this every five years because I think 10 years is a mighty long time and patients forget. The fit and screening colonoscopy can reduce colorectal cancer incidence and death. And this has been proven in many epidemiological studies done in the West. And the use of annual fecal occult blood tests significantly reduces the incidence of colorectal cancer. This screening test can be done every two years or every three years, as uh, the case may be. And this is part of some of the strategies that have been done in Asia. In the clinic setting, where we call it opportunistic screening testing, meaning that when the patients consult without symptoms, but then they're like 45 or 50 years old, we offer them a fit test or a colonoscopy. We call it opportunistic. When, once patients come in, we get, we get that opportunity to offer the test. In Asia, however, in that kind of setting, usually colonoscopy is the more uh, preferred test. Now, colonoscopies are quite important because once you detect a polyp, then you can remove the polyp. And so you save one procedure. And in my practice, in most of the GI practices, uh, this is the preferred setting. However, of course, clearly in the low income group, then maybe we can offer a fit test and only those patients who will be positive with the fit can do a colonoscopy. However, in the last line in that slide, any patient who has, who has had a polyp before will need a colonoscopy as the next surveillance test, not any more fit test. But of course, you can always discuss the fit test as a potential tool in order to save some funds. Now, the stool antigen or some of these molecular blood-based uh, examinations or radiological examinations like CT colonography or MR colonography has not been studied very well in Asia and therefore consensus did not want to offer a recommendation because there's insufficient data for recommending it. Now, there has been this question about decreasing the age for 
offering the screening test. In America, for example, the vote is down to 45. Now, in Asia, there's data on an increase in the incidence of cancers in the rectum. Not, not the entire cause, but cancers in the rectum have been described to be increasing in Hong Kong, in Japan, in Korea, and Taiwan. And I think in the Philippines, we, have, we don't have data, but I suspect that we have also that certain increase. And therefore, in the context of doing a total colonoscopy as a test for patients below 50, it might not be important because of this lack of data in the Philippines. But there is really that rising trend in the development of rectal cancer in Asia. As I said, in America, they've brought this down to 45 because they've seen the benefits of screening at uh, age 50. And now they have data that there's also an increase in the development of polyps, even as early as 45. And therefore, in the US today, and maybe, maybe even in the bigger Western countries, the lowering of that screening age has been at 45. The Asia Pacific Consensus actually looked at that and they said that, yes, because there is an awareness of 45, then what is the data? At the moment, there's really no big data. And therefore, we have seen and we have recommended that maybe lowering it to 50 might not be cost effective in Asia. Of course, in the US, as you have seen here, they are recommending that as already the starting age for colorectal cancer screening. There's an Australian study that was a model. It's what, it was not real world. It was just a model. And they have actually said that uh, there might be a good cost-effectiveness uh, value for screening patients at 45. But then because of the realities that in Asia, the screening test and the screening possibilities are still limited, that might jeopardize the benefits of those who need screening between 50 and 74 because of the, the logistical issues. And so once we have a real-world cost-effectiveness study in Asia, maybe it's, it's still immature to recommend that. Uh, in patients who are 45 or a little bit older. Last year, we said that in the Philippines, there's no data. We don't have the infrastructure for colonoscopies for nationwide uh, implementation. And I think, of course, there are no funds. And so my recommendation this year is still that because there's no data, maybe not yet at 45. All days is not a contraindication for develop or for having a screening colonoscopy. And so as long as patients are healthy, they can start colonoscopy screening at any age. And when do you stop? Here, the Asia Pacific consensus increases to 85 because most individuals today in Asia are living a little bit longer and we still get to find some benefit at screening until 85. Now, how about patients with relatives that are uh, suffering from colorectal malignancies? Here, we said that if you have a you have a first-degree relative, at least two first-degree relatives who develop a colon cancer or an adenoma, then we should start screening 10 years before that youngest individual who has developed a colon cancer, maybe at age 40. For patients who have had a first-degree relative with colorectal cancer diagnosed about 60 or more, then also the recommendation is at about age 40. And here is a table of same, some of the major regional guidelines that are implemented today in the world. And you can see that almost there is that uniform recommendation about having a one first degree relative or two first degree relatives of developed uh, colorectal cancer. And these are some of the recommendations on the interval of screening and the age of screening. You can take a screenshot of these slides so that you can apply this in your clinics. Now, we know that colonoscopies can be very burdensome to healthcare systems because they have costs, they have preparations, and there are risks. And so the recommendation of the consensus is really we need to adapt this in our individual settings. Like say, for example, in, even in the Philippines, the setting in Metro Manila can be different from the setting in Davao, for example. And so every industry is, is or every society is encouraged to take on a close look at what, at what the capacities of your local facilities should be. The frequency of undergoing surveillance colonoscopy should be tailored according to individual risk of the patient and, of course, the other logistical issues that are available in your in your locality. It does emphasize, however, that there might be either an overuse or an underuse of colonoscopy depending on which settings. And so, as I said, a good study of that locally in your practices and, of course, in the region. We also would like to emphasize that we need to have a good quality colonoscopy because a good quality colonoscopy can not miss a 
benign lesion that has a tendency to develop malignancies, especially like uh, serrated sessile adenomas. And we know that the chances of detecting a polyp or a precancerous lesion in the colon is really basically dependent on the quality of your colonoscopy. We know, for example, that in patients with low-risk adenomas, less than 10 centimeters or, or 10 millimeters that are, that are followed up for years, it seems that at this, at this stage, the data seems to favor that if a good quality colonoscopy and a good polypectomy has been done, the patients are protected. Now, what is a high-quality colonoscopy? High-quality colonoscopy means that if you are uh, the layman today, you're listening, it must be that your colonoscopy report should contain that they have intubated up to the cecum. In fact, we always encourage that they are to intubate up to the terminal ileum. So you should see that in your report, that the bowel preparation was inadequate and there was no there was no stools or no debris that covers majority of the mucosa of the colon. There's a good appropriate withdrawal time, which is six minutes or longer, and that the, added, the adenoma detection rate of your colonoscopy should be high. Because if it, if they cannot detect small polyps, then useless to have a colonoscopy with this with these endoscopists. And if you have a polyp, make sure that you also have a report that the polyp has been adequately resected, and there has been no complication. It means that your colonoscopist is an expert in the safe colonoscopist. Because a low quality colonoscopy leads to the occurrence of post colonoscopy colorectal cancer, meaning that even if you have undergone a colonoscopy that has not protected you because the quality of the colonoscopy was bad. So what is an adenoma detection rate? Adenoma detection rate is the average of the pace of the colonoscopist or the gastroenterologist to be able to detect adenoma in a patient. There's about an estimated that in every patient that you do or in all the patients that you do, there may be about 20% who will have a, a polyp. And so if your colonoscopist has an adenoma detection rate of 25% or more, then he has a good ADR, and therefore he is a very good colonoscopist who can protect you from the development of col colorectal cancer in the future. Polyp detection rate and serrated polyp detection rates are nice qualities that can that can be had in your colonoscopies, but at the moment, we really don't want to use them as well as ADRs in the assessment of the quality and the skill of your endoscopist. So an ADR of 25 or more is a good ADR for any colonoscopist. Now, after removal of uh, high-risk adenoma, that means uh, an adenoma with high-grade dysplasia or villous component or sizes that are more than one centimeter or three number, the recommended surveillance colonoscopy should be done at three years. Some patients would like to do this after one year, but at least you are safe at three years. There's a study done in Japan which shows that colonoscopy between one and three years or colonoscopies every three years uh, are able to detect adenomas in the same manner. And so most effectively, maybe every three years. Now, there is this emphasis of the Asia-Pacific consensus this year to look at and define sessile serrated lesions. These are pre-malignant lesions. They should uh, be detected. They're more common in the right part of the colon. And most of the patients who will have a missed SSL will have a high risk of developing a malignancy in the future. This is the new classification that the WHO has uh, made, and I don't want to burden you with this because this is for the endoscopist, basically. We know that they are highly undiagnosed in Asia because our awareness of, of SSLs are not as high as in the, the West, and therefore there's this campaign by most of us, reminding every one of our colleagues that they have to have a very good detection of sessile serrated adenomas because they're flat, they're small, they look innocent, and can be easily missed. And this will be better detected if the training and the awareness of the colonoscopist in the trainees are very high. Colonoscopy should be recommended as the usual, uh, three years of interval for uh, one SSL that is more than 10 millimeters in diameter or in patients who have a cytological dysplasia uh, on biopsy. Now, additional statements before I close. Uh, the reminder that the quality of a FIT program depends on the adherence and initial testing, plus of course follow-up, meaning therefore that when patients get a positive FIT test, they should be recalled, asked to come to the office and have a colonoscopy. And timely colonoscopies after a positive test, that means three months or less, 
of colonoscopy after a positive test, we'll have a very, very good screening program results once you are able to implement this. And then, therefore, a screening examination or screening program is really basically based on a very good uh, non-invasive uh, screening test like a FIT and an effective and efficient recall system so that patients will have a sequential colonoscopy once they test positive for FIT. And the quality of all these implement implementations of these programs are the qualities of a good a colorectal cancer screening program, if you may. In summary, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, uh, despite the trends of younger age of onset of colorectal cancer, in Asia, moving the age of screening to below 50 years old is not yet recommended. There's emphasis on risk assessment. And of course, we want to make sure that we are only uh, doing screening examinations for what we think are a norm, uh, an average risk or a high risk individual. Surveillance for adenoma must be tailored to the risk of adenomas that were identified and removed at colonoscopy to reduce unnecessary repeated colonoscopy examinations and the high quality colonoscopy and polypectomy is emphasized in this Asia Pacific consensus. Sessile serrated adenomas are important causes of post colonoscopy colorectal cancer and largely ignored in Asia and should therefore be emphasized in our training programs among ourselves who are doing colonoscopy so that we'll be trained to detect all of them. Studies on improving the health seeking behavior of asymptomatic individuals is another important subject of research in Asia Pacific because here I think we are constrained by funds, by the attitude and the lack of awareness. And therefore we need to have a nationwide campaign and of course later on an assessment of the way that we have improved the awareness of individuals who are asymptomatic so that they come for us for screening and hopefully we'll be able to detect early cancers in these individuals. I think we have dealt with this third Pacific, Asia Pacific consensus recommendations quite extensively. And therefore I'd like to thank you for your time and I'll be ready to answer questions in the open forum. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Professor Soliano, for such an eloquent talk on the latest consensus guidelines that will guide our local physicians. It's always a delight to listen to your lectures, Professor. The next talk will be on health economics and partnership between private medical institutions and the local government units. Our final speaker is a medical graduate of the University of the East Ramon Magsaysay Memorial Medical Center. She's the president of the Cancer Care Registry Philippines Foundation Incorporated and a board of director of the Philippine College of Surgeon Cancer Commission. Let us welcome Dr. Nessie Huat. Good morning. I'm Dr. Nessi Huat. I'm a medical oncologist at the Medical City. I'm here to present to you a topic on screening and also the economic side. So the topic for this uh, webinar is Towards a Universal Cancer Care Beyond the Pandemic. So this is just to show to you the cancer in the Philippines. This is just a bird's eye view of cancer in the Philippines. Cancer is the leading cause of death worldwide with approximately 10 million mortalities recorded in 2020, accounting for nearly one in every six deaths. Cancer in the lung, breast, colon, rectum, and prostate are the most common. This is based on the World Health Organization of 2021. So 189 of every 100,000 Filipinos have cancer, and four Filipinos die of cancer every hour, or 96 cancer patients every day. Cancer care is a high-cost health service in the Philippines. So 2019, the cancer expenditure ranked between 12 and 13 out of the 26. It is a disease-specific expenditure, totaled around 18.8 billion. So medicine drive high expenditure. So it is estimated that 55% of total public health expenditure came from the medicine. And I just want to show to you an action study. This is a prospective cohort study to look at the economic impact of cancer in the Philippine household in Metro Manila. 
patient with first-time cancer were recruited from oncology clinic from PGH, from Jose Reyes, St. Luke's, National Kidney and Transplant Institute, and Veterans Memorial Medical Center. From year 2012 to 2014, the primary outcome at 12 months is the financial catastrophe after cancer treatment. So financial catastrophe definition means that the out-of-pocket cost at 12 months is equal to or exceeding 30% of the annual household income. So the PESO study described the economic impact of cancer on the Filipino patient. The finding at the end of the study showed that at the end of 12-month follow-up period, 26.4 died and 40% had financial catastrophe. Cancer is a significant economic burden leading decrease in household income and patients with cancer become less economically productive member of society. And I just want to share to you the index of cancer preparedness. It was done by the economist, published in the Economist Intelligence Unit of 2020, where in the Philippines is in the, in terms of the overall score, we are on the 10th, meaning we're on the last. This is based on the scoring of the policy and planning, care delivery, health system, and governance. As you can see from this table, the Philippines rank in the health system and governance. This is because of the approval of our NICA law. Okay, in terms of the assessment of selective preventive action, as you can see from this graph, in terms of the national HPV vaccination program, we have also for cervical cancer, but in terms of for breast, we only have a clinical breast exam where in the recommendation is a mammography. In terms of the bowel cancer, we don't have a screening or colonoscopy as part of the screening program of, of the government. Now, let's talk about the impact of early di diagnosis. Like, for example, this is a study done in NHS wherein if you, you can see the patient earlier or early diagnosis, then you will have less cost in terms of the treatment cost. Like, for example, for colon, if you have an early diagnosis, you have 3,400 pounds compared to a later diagnosis of 12,500. For rectal, if you have an early diagnosis, you only spend 4,400 pounds compared to 11,800. Now, in terms of the savings, as you can see for colon, rectal, ovarian, and lung, all four cancer will give a significant saving of 44 million pounds. Now, let's go back to lung cancer. As you can see, there is a negative 6 million pounds. This is because the chance of recurrence for lung cancer is very high. And that's the reason you don't have savings in lung cancer. Now, the challenges in the Philippines, that this is based on the study in by Apostol in the Oncology Financing in April, published in 2021, where in prevention, in terms of a prevention, there is lack of clear prioritization of resources within the DOH for health promotion for cancer prevention. Second, for preventable cancer wherein vaccination plays a key role, such as your hepatitis B and hepatitis for cervical CAHPV vaccine, financing the distribution and delivery of the products to healthcare facility has been problematic. Now, in terms of the screening, funded screening programs for various cancers are limited on the national level, but are on the government's agenda to be expanded. But there is no assurance that LGU will follow and fund DOH recommendations. Now, how do we close the gap in cancer care? One, we, we want to share to you the 10 principles of screening by Wilson and Junger, wherein the condition should be an important health problem. So, which means colorectal is in the top, breast is in the top, and lung cancer is in the top. So these are all important health problems. There should be an acceptable treatment for patients with recognized disease. Facilities for diagnosis and treatment should be available. And there should be a recognizable latent or early symptomatic phase. There should be a suitable test or examination. And the test should be acceptable to the population. The natural history of the condition, including development from latent to declared disease, should be adequately understood, and there should be an agreed policy on whom to treat as patient. 
the cost of case finding should be economically balanced in relation to possible expenditure on medical care as a whole. And case finding should be a continuous process and not once and for all project. Now, how about the characteristic of a good screening program? We have an essential and desirable criteria. The program should have a policy framework from health authorities defining the governance structure, financing, goal and objectives of the program, equity of access to screening, diagnosis, treatment services should be built into the program. And we should also have an availability of adequate infrastructure, workforce, and supplies for delivery of screening, diagnosis, treatment, and services. A specified organization or team is responsible for program implementation and coordination. Also, program has an evidence-based protocol guideline developed in consensus with majority of stakeholders defining the target population, the screening interval, the test, the referral pathway, the management of positive case, monitoring and evaluation. And this is where our FEHEC consensus guideline comes in. So HCP comply with protocol guideline of the screening program while delivering services. We also have, should have a system in place for identifying the target population, eligible individual for screening, notifying the results and informing follow-up, sending recall notice to the non-compliant individual, identifying cancer occurrence in the target population. And also, it is also important that we have an information system with appropriate linkages. So between population database, screening information, and cancer registry for screening implementation and evaluation. We should also have an appropriate legal framework exists for registration of individual and establishing these data linkages. Also important to have a continued training for service provider the screening program has an operational plan to encourage participation for the target population through improved awareness. Eligible individuals should be given informed choice with information on benefits and harms. So it should be in the quality improvement framework. We need an auditing of the program through a specified team organization responsible for quality assurance and improvement. We should also have an appropriate indicator having reference standard. And the performance of cancer screening program is evaluated, published, and widely disseminated on a regular basis. This table will just show to you the building blocks of uh, elements of an organized cancer screening. You should have a leadership, governance, finance, health workforce, access to essential services, service delivery provision, and information system, and quality assurance. Now let's talk about the partner perspective, partners in health. So I would just like to share with you the four T's. So the first T is buy-in from partners is required in order for government to meet their goals. Time for discussion, debate, and collaboration through all stages of planning and partners will likely show more support for the program and remain invested. The second T is the personal touch. We create a space to meet regularly, and we all know that collaborative people collaborate better. Our third T is trust in the data. We need clear planning, monitoring, and evaluation system add value by tracking resources and results across partners and government collaborative problem solving, and sharing best practices. And the last T is the transition. The most effective partners are the ones that help the government eventually operate in a sustained and independent manner. So thank you for listening. And uh, this is a sticker uh, where we gave it during the National Cancer Seminar. Let's reduce inequities in cancer care. Hello, I'm Dr. June Ruiz, a Philippine and American board certified gastroenterologist, the lead for colorectal cancer screening at the Medical City and the programs and advocacy officer of the Augusto P. Sarmiento 
Cancer Institute. I am also a medical author, health writer, occasional journalist, online content creator, and patient advocate. We will be talking about colorectal cancer in this special video lecture. March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. This successful international campaign for colorectal cancer screening had its beginnings in America in the year 2000. After a decade, our country joined this crusade and the medical city was among the pioneers. The Medical City aims to be at the forefront in the fight against colorectal cancer and has been a champion in this advocacy since 2010. Today, the number of medical institutions and organizations that join this battle against this cancer has grown. Colorectal cancer was in the spotlight in 2020 after the Avengers and Black Panther star Chadwick Boseman died from it at the young age of 43. Over the last decade, there had been big concerns in the medical community that this cancer has been increasingly diagnosed in much younger patients. We will be discussing the salient points of colorectal cancer from prevention to screening, diagnosis, and management. This is an important advocacy as colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer among Filipinos. Colorectal cancer can simply be called colon cancer. Colon cancer either involves the large intestine or the rectum, which is the last part of our digestive tract where the colon connects to the anus. Its high prevalence all over the world makes screening so much important for this cancer as it is a preventable and screenable cancer. It is the third most common cancer in the world and the second most common cancer killer affecting both men and women. Colon cancer is an ideal target for early detection. Screening can save lives and has been shown to reduce the risk of colon cancer by as high as 70%. In the Philippines, the 2020 Globocam report published that colorectal cancer ranks third among Filipinos, despite it being one of the most treatable and preventable cancers. An estimated 17,364 new patients were reported to have been diagnosed with colon and rectal cancer next to breast and lung cancers that were the most prevalent. Liver cancers and prostate cancers rank fourth and fifth respectively. How does colon cancer start? Cancer is a result of the interaction between genetics and the environment leading to neoplastic changes and malignancy. Mutation is an alteration in the genetic material of a cell's DNA of a living organism that is more or less permanent and that can be transmitted to the cell's descendants. It can be genetic or acquired. A multi-step process of specific genetic changes and stepwise accumulation of acquired multiple somatic mutations is involved in the transformation from normal to cancer cells. Almost all of these cancers arise over a long period of time as most tumors grow slowly, possibly taking around 10 years for some polyps to develop into cancer. Colonic polyps are abnormal growths that may form in the lining of the large intestine. This can be pre-malignant or pre-cancerous if these are of the adenomatous or serrated adenomatous types on biopsy. The risk to becoming cancer in these polyps increases with size, pelus type of architecture, and a finding of dysplasia on biopsy, which is a term used to describe the presence of abnormal cells within a tissue or organ. Dysplasia is not cancer, but it may sometimes become cancer. Given the long process of this transformation, screening for colorectal polyps and its subsequent removal greatly reduces the risk of the person developing colon cancer. What are the risks for colon cancer? The risk of developing colon cancer is influenced by both the genetic and environmental factors. This can also be classified as either modifiable or non-modifiable risk factors. 
Individual risk factors are non-modifiable and include age greater than 50, personal history of polyps or prior colon cancer, a family history of colon cancer including hereditary colon cancer syndromes and pre-existing diseases like inflammatory bowel disease. Age greater than 50 is the most common risk factor for colon cancer. A personal history of the colorectal adenomatous type of polyps or prior colon cancer is another major risk factor. A family history of first-degree relative, parent, siblings, or children with sporadic colon cancer increases the risk two to threefold. The risk is especially higher when the cancer occurred before the age of 60 or when two relatives have colon cancer. Persons whose only risk factor is age greater than 50 are considered average risk. On the other hand, environmental influence risk factors that contribute to the formation of colon cancer are considered modifiable. These are lifestyle habits that can be avoided and improved on. These include cigarette smoking, alcohol consumption, diabetes, and obesity. There is a strong association between colon cancer and a diet that has high saturated fat, high red meat or processed meat, and low fiber. Physical inactivity and lack of exercise is also considered a risk factor. The American Heart Association recommends adults to do at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity or 75 minutes a week of vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity. What are the signs and symptoms of colon cancer? Some patients with colon cancer may experience no symptoms, especially in the early stages of the disease. These polyps and very early cancer are usually asymptomatic. When symptoms occur, this may vary depending on the cancer size and location in your colon. The majority of asymptomatic patients with early stage colon cancer are diagnosed as a result of screening examination. In countries without screening programs, most colon cancers are diagnosed after the onset of symptoms. The symptoms of colon cancer may include rectal bleeding, either hematochesia, which is red blood in the stools, or rarely melina, which is described as black tarry stools change in bowel habits that can either be diarrhea or constipation, a decrease in the caliber of stools like pencil thin stools, abdominal pain or bloating, unexplained iron deficiency anemia, unintentional weight loss, and in advanced cases, it may present as an abdominal or rectal mass that can cause a bowel obstruction. Once colon cancer is suspected, the next urgent test should be a colonoscopy, as it is the most accurate diagnostic test. But what is a colonoscopy? The procedure involves a flexible fiber optic scope with a light and a camera that is inserted through the rectum and carefully advanced to visualize the entire colon under light anesthesia. Thus, the patient is asleep and does not experience pain. It can detect and remove lesions like polyps before they turn to cancer, as well as biopsy abnormal masses that are suspicious for colon cancer. The diagnosis of colon cancer is usually made on a colonoscopy and confirmed by histologic examination of the biopsy. The majority of the cancers arising in the colon and rectum are adenocarcinomas. Once the patient is diagnosed with colon or rectal cancer, what is next for the patient? After cancer is confirmed on biopsy, the patient is referred to a surgeon as surgery cures early cancer. Concurrent chemotherapy is recommended for patients with advanced disease, especially those with lymph node involvement and distant metastasis. Patients with advanced cancer may not be surgical candidates and are treated for palliation. Once a diagnosis of colon cancer is established, the local and distant extent of the disease is determined 
to provide a framework for discussing therapy and prognosis. In patients with newly diagnosed cancer, preoperative chest, abdominal, and pelvic CT scans can demonstrate tumor extension, regional lymphatics, and distant metastasis. Serum levels of the tumor marker carcinoembryonic antigen, or CEA, should be obtained preoperatively in all patients. How do we stage colorectal cancer? Stage one, the cancer invades the muscular wall of the colon and there is no involvement of the lymph nodes. Stage two, the cancer invades beyond the muscular wall and extends into the surrounding organs and structures, but still without lymph node involvement. Stage three, the cancer has already involved the regional lymph nodes. In stage four, the cancer has already spread to the distant organs like the liver and the lungs. The five-year survival rate of persons affected with this cancer at stage one is over 90% when diagnosed early, but less than 15% when diagnosed at stage four. Surgery is the only curative modality for localized colon cancer. The goals include complete removal of the cancer, the major blood vessel, and the lymphatic drainage of the affected colonic segment. Restoration of the bowel continuity using a primary anastomosis that involves the removal of a segment of the colon and the subsequent reconnection of the remaining segments can be accomplished in most patients undergoing an uncomplicated colectomy. The colectomy can be open or laparoscopic assisted. For the majority of patients who have invasive rectal cancers, a more extensive surgery is required such as low anterior resection or abdominal perineal resection. In certain situations, surgery provides a potentially curative option for selected patients with limited metastatic disease, like those predominantly in the liver and the lungs. Some patients who are classified stage three or four may be appropriate candidates for initial chemotherapy, including those who are not candidates for surgery as they have unresectable colon cancer or those whose margins of surgical resection are potentially compromised. Adjuvant therapy refers to a treatment which is given after or in combination with surgery. Following a potentially curative resection, adjuvant or post-operative chemotherapy eradicates micrometastasis, reduces the likelihood of recurrence of cancer, and increases the cure rate. The benefits have been mostly clearly demonstrated in patients with stage three node positive disease. On the other hand, neoadjuvant therapy refers to medical treatment that is given before the main cancer treatment, which is usually surgery. Neoadjuvant or preoperative chemoradiotherapy with or without chemotherapy rather than initial surgery is the common approach for locally advanced rectal cancer to downstage the rectal cancer prior to surgery. Local recurrence is more frequent with rectal cancer due to the local anatomy and difficulty in obtaining adequate resection margins. For patients who present with metastatic disease and are not surgical candidates, initial management is individualized, palliative chemotherapy is generally recommended. The newer treatments for metastatic colorectal cancer are immunotherapy that boosts the immune system of the patient by making the immune cells more effective in finding and killing the cancer cells, and targeted therapies that include humanized monoclonal antibodies that inhibit cancer cells or blood proliferation. These treatments have proven to be quite effective in patients with specific colorectal cancer subtypes. Cancer screening is looking for cancer before the person has any symptoms. Screening also finds cancer at an early stage when there is a great chance for a cure. When colorectal cancer is found at an early stage, the five-year survival rate is around 90%. When do we recommend screening for colorectal cancer? Screening is recommended for average risk asymptomatic persons aged 50 years and older in our country as well as almost the rest of the world. 
patients aged 50 to 75 are the target population for screening. Earlier colon cancer screening is advocated in patients with additional risk factors like family history of colorectal cancer and inflammatory bowel disease. First degree relatives of patients with sporadic colon cancer should undergo screening at the age of 40 or 10 years before the age of the index case, whichever comes first. Due to increasing incidence of colon cancer in persons younger than 50 and after reassessing new clinical data among American patients, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force changed the recommendation to begin screening average risk persons for colon cancer at the age of 45. As genetics play a big role in the incidence of colon cancer, Americans have a much higher risk to colon cancer supporting their early screening at the age of 45. However, the genetics of Filipinos and the environmental factors in our country are very much different than those in America. So these new guidelines cannot be automatically adopted here. In low resource countries like ours, there is no official national screening program established by the government. In addition, the compliance with screening guidelines by patients is still relatively low due to the lack of awareness and patient education. The two main methods of colorectal cancer screening in average risk individuals recommended by the different international gastroenterology societies are, first is the colonoscopy, which is the gold standard for colon cancer screening. Colonoscopy has the benefit of high sensitivity of 94 to 98% for colorectal cancer. As mentioned, it can remove polyps and biopsy abnormal masses. However, it is an invasive test and has a low potential to cause complications. If your colonoscopy is normal and you do not have risk factors other than age greater than 50, the next colonoscopy is after 10 years. Some patients may not want to have an invasive test or may find the cost of a colonoscopy expensive. A stool test called fecal immunochemical test is a good screening alternative. FIT detects only human blood and is specific for bleeding in the colon. The test is repeated every year as bleeding from cancers or large polyp may be intermittent. If the test is positive, a colonoscopy is needed to rule out the presence of cancer. If the initial test is negative, then it is repeated the following year. The sensitivity of fit is 79%, while the specificity is 94%. There are other tests that are considered second tier and may be considered in certain situations like the fecal DNA or Cologuard, CT colonography, and sigmoidoscopy. Parium enema is no longer used due to its poor sensitivity. The colon capsule endoscopy and the blood test for an altered gene test called CEP9 are still not recommended for prime time. Prevention is still better than cure. Living a healthy lifestyle can lower your risk for colon cancer. Eating a nutritious diet that is high in fiber and low in processed meat, regular exercise, avoiding smoking, not consuming excessive alcohol can lower the risk of colorectal cancer. Getting the appropriate screening test at the age of 50 or when indicated will prevent colon cancer. My friends, let us all remember that colon cancer is preventable, treatable, and beatable. Talk to your physician now about the benefits of screening.
Good morning again everyone. Uh, magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. Uh, I am Dr. June Ruiz again and I would like to thank our viewers for staying up to this time listening to the lectures of our three excellent speakers. First, uh, we will have a reaction on the three talks then followed by a Q&A session and finally we will premiere the video lecture on colon cancer by yours truly to close this webinar. So to summarize, first, we have Dr. Beverly Ho, who gave us updates on the NICA law, where there are so many wonderful features that benefit cancer patients, like expansion of coverage of services for cancer patients in the spectrum that now include prevention to palliation, and now a more sizable budget for medicine assistance and other diagnostic exams. Then we have Professor Jose Soliano, who gave us a review of the latest third Asia-Pacific consensus guidelines in screening patients for colon cancer. His opinion last year to stick to the age of 50 as far as the start of screening among Filipinos was validated by this consensus. Finally, we had Dr. Nese Huat, who discussed the economics of cancer experience, what are considered to be good screening programs and the public-private partnership. Now, we will, uh, to give a reaction to the said talks, is our Institute Director of the Augusto P. Sarmiento Cancer Institute of the Medical City. She's also a past president of the Philippine Medical Society of Medical Oncology and the CEO of Cancer Care Registry and Research Philippines Foundation. Let us welcome Dr. Beatriz Chanco. Hello, Doctor. Hello, good morning, June. Uh, you can hear me, right? Because you're waving to me. I can, can hear you perfectly, Doctor Trixie. Thank you. I uh, agree with you wholeheartedly when you said that our three speakers were excellent. And um, I'm very grateful to them for everything they have shared and to you for organizing uh, this forum, as you do every year. I think um, what was going on in my mind while listening was it's really very challenging to be a reactor because unlike a speaker where you can prepare and you know organize your thoughts to react uh, really means to to listen actively listen and and pick out the points that are relevant and um i decided to just share with you this morning really what was going on in my mind no while listening uh, so and i'm hoping that i can reflect uh, what uh, is also going on in the minds of our audience so just really uh, three things. Uh, one is um, roller coaster den yung dinaana ng utak ko, no? Listening to our excellent speakers. First, uh, there was Dr. Beverly Hall, uh, who was so refreshing to listen to. She's young, uh, uh, very intelligent, and uh, very dedicated. And you could see uh, her passion for public health. Um, and maswerte na lang tayo na nasama yung cancer no sa kanyang radar screen no and that she's really a, a, a very good uh, and refreshing addition to the department of health so uh, thank you dr beverly uh, for the plans that you have shared with us and um, everything optimistic and i uh, do hope that we are going to be able to monitor uh, all your plans uh, so that uh, we will see uh, whether we are uh, headed in the right direction uh, as envisioned by the current DOH. Um, with uh, Dr. Nesi Huat, um, less optimistic, in fact, a little bit depressing, we're in, we placed last in the index of cancer preparedness. And uh, we're in, uh, we could see that uh, there was um, lack of clear prioritization in the study of uh, Dr. Apostol, and there's a pro pro problems in our vaccination programs, and there are, of course, limited funding for screening. And uh, thank you, Dr. Anesi, for sharing the importance of screening and what are the components of a uh, uh, successful screening program. And we do hope we are going to be able to do this um, moving forward. Dr. Soliano, um, of course, uh, 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 always uh, very educational and very easy to understand, which is really uh, the hallmark of a good teacher. Do Thank you, Dr. Soliano, for updating us on the uh, screening for colorectal cancer. And I think your most uh, common or the 
most often repeated line uh, was there is no local data. You, if I had counted, probably I would have counted maybe almost 10 times you said that. And thank you for emphasizing that there is no local data. So even in referencing all the, the um, practice guidelines abroad and in all the goings on uh, abroad, also Dr. Beverly, um, in all the sources, most of the sources also of Dr. Nessie were created abroad, but we do need local data. We do need to find out um, what age uh, should we start screening our own Filipinos for colorectal cancer. Uh, beginning what age, up to what age, uh, when will we be able to achieve uh, less than 30% catastrophe, you know, uh, in, in, in households. Uh, of our Filipinos uh, diagnosed with colorectal cancer or with any cancer. These are the things we long for, we dream for. I, I think we're closer to our dreams than we were in the past years. And I'm, um, I, I hope that we can all continue to work together uh, with an all of society approach uh, towards eliminating colorectal cancer and all cancers in the country. It's doable if we work together and that this morning's uh, forum is a good sign that we're going to be able to do it together. Back to you, Jim. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chanko, for that wonderful and excellent reaction. So here we will be welcoming back our speakers and Dr. Chanko is still joining us in the Q&A session. So let us welcome uh, Assistant Secretary, Dr. Beverly Ho. Dr. Nessie Huat, and unfortunately, Professor Jose Soliano is unable to join us because he is in Copenhagen and he really wanted to join us. Unfortunately, we have technical problems, so uh, he won't be joining us, but we do have uh, Dr. Bev, Dr. Nessie, and Dr. Chanko for our Q&A uh, session. So um, may I ask uh, Dr. Nessie and Dr. Bev to greet our viewers? Dr. Bev, you want to greet our viewers? Um, thank you, Dr. June, for um, having us here. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're very grateful to be part of this um, colorectal cancer um, webinar today. And hello to our co-panelists, uh, Ma'am Beatriz and also Ma'am Nessie. Um, good morning, Po. Thank you, Dr. Bev. See, Dr. Bev is so busy. So we were really lucky that she was able to join us in this forum. As a matter of fact, she was in meetings just prior to this Q&A session. So thank you very much, Dr. Bev. Uh, Dr. Nessie, you want to greet our audience? Uh, thank you, Dr. June, for uh, for this uh, event. Uh, every year, so Susuki na tayo. And also, I uh, would like to say Good morning to Dr. Beverly Ho and Dr. Tianko, my mentor. <laughs> okay. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Nies. So let's now go to our burning questions. So the first question is for Dr. Bev. Okay. Uh, so Nika, obviously, the question will be about Nika. So the Nika will probably be recognized as one of the landmark health bills to benefit the Filipino people. And I think the list should include the Universal Health Care Act, the Generics Act of 1988, and maybe the controversial Reproductive Health Bill. I truly believe that it is time that our cancer patients will finally enjoy the benefits they deserve from this law that the government, that the DOH, had carefully planned and implemented. So I actually have two questions for Dr. Bev. So the first one has something to do with the Philippine Cancer Center, which is built under NICA as the national specialty center, like a mother base or command center, right? And just four weeks ago, uh, we heard it in the news, uh, NEDA approved the UPPGH Cancer Center as the first public-private partnership of this present administration. So with this expansion of the UPPGH Cancer Center, how will this hospital function under NICA? Will it be like a second national cancer specialty center? Will it act as complementary to the Philippine Cancer Center or independently, independently outside NICA? So that's the first question. 
The second question is about on the budget. What is our current budget for this year and what is the distribution of money among the different programs with INICA? Dr. Bev? Okay, thank you very much, Dr. June. Uh, pretty challenging questions, but all the more very relevant. Uh, first, um, what is clear to us is definitely we do have a Philippine Health Facility Development Plan as showed in the presentation that lays out um, where we would want our health facilities to be. You know? But at the same time, we know that that plan is also siempre constrained you know, by the available facilities that we have in the country and the budget. You know? So we welcome this initiative by the Philippine General Hospital because of course they had to do a lot of legwork um, to make sure that the financial projections, etc., will actually um, be approved no, towards um, having a, a PPP um, structure that is approved by the NEDA. So definitely, um, when we do even our um, health facility plan, we welcome more facilities to be part of it. No? At the end of the day, um, in general, within the UHC um, tenets, what is clear to us is we want that as much as possible, government will finance but the delivery of the service does not necessarily have to be a government facility. Diba? So parang, um, as much as possible, we want public to finance um, basic um, essential services, which would include cancer care, but um, we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily biased that it's only public who will be providing. So then um, to answer your question, definitely means that there will be a lot of complementation between what um, this PGH Cancer Center will do vis-a-vis um, -vis our, not just PCC, no, but um, all the other cancer specialty centers that we have. Um, in our conversations with DocGap, no, um, we all know that we're all spread out too thinly, diba? so even you um, as private uh, practitioner, are doing all of these advocacy activities because there's just so much for us to to do compared to the need in this country. No? So, um, ayo din naman natin na we overlap on each other's work, pero hindi yon maiiwasan. No? So, maybe for certain things, um, someone will take on a bigger role, but for some things, um, someone will take on a lesser role. Um, but for us, we're also very clear that um, PCC will definitely be a coordinator um, but it will not try to monopolize everything, diba? Kasi we recognize that a lot of expertise lies outside of the DOH infrastructure or the PCC infrastructure. And then, sir, I'll just answer the second The budget, question. yeah, about the budget. Okay. So, for the second question on the budget, this year, we have around $1 billion for our uh, medicines program. Um, so, that's the CSP map. And then we have around 500 million pesos for the Cancer Assistance Fund. No? So for everyone's um, information, the medicines program um, will entail that we actually provide um, the medicines in kind no, to our access sites. Um, and the access sites are not prohibited no, to share these medicines with their network. Diba? And so yung parang siguro pinaka-call din namin because we're now in the process of developing the budget. No? proposal for 2024 is we encourage the existing cancer access sites to really reach out not to their network diba? and um, include it in their projections what their network of hospitals will require. No? So dati kung sariling pasyente lang nila yung kinakalculate nila, then they can um, add more to it by working with their neighboring facilities. Then the 500 million that we're talking about for Cancer Assistance Fund is a special initiative also by our legislators, which um, will be allowed to be used um, for things other than medicines. No? So it could probably include diagnostics, um, certain tests, etc., which are not covered under the PhilHealth packages. I think what is not um, really labeled as cancer funds that are also important will be number one, the MAIP, no? the medical assistance for um, indigent patients that we also have. This is around 30 billion in fact, no? spread across different um, malasakit centers throughout the country and it could complement no? whether you have cancer or, or other conditions actually, you can access these no? for your medical expenditures. 
And then finally, um, medyo under-emphasize sa cancer work yung prevention, di ba? So, syempre, we also do have budget for vaccines, no? So, for vaccination, like to a limited extent ngayon, HPV vaccines, kunwari, but um, we have already requested for um, updated um, HPA, you know, um, assessment because we all know the developments in different parts of the world, how um, HPV vaccines have basically made um, cervical cancer diba, irrelevant no? in other settings. And we want to get to this point as well. So um, currently, we have our immunization program budget, which includes some small amount of money for cervical cancer uh, for HPV vaccines. But we hope that this could um, be increased further in the coming years. No? And syempre for liver, diba, um, kept di naman yun, no? So overall, um, our EPI vaccines is around 5 billion pesos. No? So some of them will be um, syempre benefiting or lowering risk for certain types of cancers, but not everything. But overall, our immunization uh, budget is around 5 billion. So I think, sir, overall, that's really um, the split of the monies that we have. Over pop. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Bev. I think those are really wonderful answers to hear from you, especially on the part of the UPPGH Cancer Center, that it would be more complementary to uh, to the National Center, especially if you have more budget, right? And then if you have more hospital beds, then you have more patients who can be served. So that is actually great news. So I would like to ask the input of Dr. Trixie. She's actually part of the uh, uh, group of doctors planning on the UPPGH Cancer Center. Dr. Trixie, what is your take on Dr. Bev's uh, answers? Dr. Um, yeah, thank, thank you, June. Thank you, uh, Bebs. Uh, if I may call you <laughs> Bebs, uh, I'm a little bit older than you. <laughs> no. um, I, yeah, I was thinking uh, about your, your answer uh, as that there being, you know, enough room for everyone because we're, we're never going to run out of patients. And maybe it doesn't really matter who does the service, if better. Uh, as you said, government will pay for it, perhaps through Phil Hill, uh, but that's not going to stop anyone from uh, helping each other, right? And 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 I remember when we were with uh, uh, under Dr. Vergere, current OIC um, Secretary of Health, uh, in the implementing rules and regulation of the NICA, uh, she kept reminding us: next door there is the UHC Technical Working Group creating the IRR of that. Uh, law and so, parang we have to work under the umbrella of the Universal Healthcare Act, and we also uh, need to remember and, and the Universal Healthcare Act, naman, always emphasizes an all of society approach. So, uh, hin hindi agawan sa pasyente pero tulungan no? uh, sa pagtulong uh, sa pag sa pasyente parang kapit bising. Um, so that's my reaction uh, regarding uh, PGH and uh, PCC and uh, working together. Um, the other thing is you mentioned um, so that in the use of the CSP map, so that um, uh, it will not just be based on your personal practice, if I remember right, but find out the needs of all patients and not just based on your practice. Um, and I, I want to offer um, the DOH our data in our hospital-based cancer registry uh, because it's very clear uh, we have 15,000 patients from um, 25 hospitals this year. So we're already 44 members. But um, so far, uh, in our uh, summary data for 2022, 15,000 patients, 15,000 cancer patients from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. And it's very clear the breakdown of patients consistent with the population-based cancer registry, but also inconsistent because there's more head and neck, there's more thyroid, there's more um, and less lung cancer, and we don't know where the lung cancer patients are. But I think that there is value to the data that we have. And of course, uh, we'll be more than happy to share it with you, but this could be one resource for you uh, to decide as using your health economics experts like Dr. Anesi, uh, how to budget our very limited budget uh, 
five million, five billion, one billion, five hundred million. Not enough, uh, but much appreciated. So I think uh, that's all I have to say, June. Sorry, I talked too much. Thank you, Dr. Trix. How about Dr. Nessie? What is your intake uh, on the UPPGH, uh, the National Cancer Center, from what uh, Dr. Bev has mentioned? And as far as the budget, I know you talk about economics. Is the budget enough for our cancer patients, Dr. Nessie? Uh, of course, there's always, uh, in terms of the budget, there's always kulang uh, lagi. No? It's, it's, it's a matter of allocating it. So that's one. Um, it, establishing a cancer center in PGH, it's, I think it's a good decision for the PGH group to put up a cancer center. You have to remember, um, PGH is the referral center, actually sa lahat eh. So that's one. So I think for cancer, they will be the referral center. So most of the patient would be coming from Cavite, Laguna, Manila. Now, if you want to put up another center, uh, sa north naman, um, I think it's also a good decision for DOH because it would cater coming from Bulacan, Pangasinan, or, or even the Quezon City area. So, yun nga, sabi ni Dr. Chanko, um, maraming pasyente na nga nailangan. So, more hospital bed. But the problem is, the healthcare workers, so that's one problem. We can always build a lot of hospital, but in terms of the personnel that would work dun sa hospital na yan, that's that's one another problem. So isa isang problem pa rin yung lalabas. But I uh, hopefully we can uh, kaya kaya ng gobyerno uh, natin. I mean kaya lahat if we will just work together, the public and the private. I don't think the government kaya ng government. Eh. As a private practitioner, then uh, of course, I think Dr. Atiyako of her uh, NGO, mga foundation, uh, and uh, her advocacy for registry, um, I think uh, kaka kaya kaya. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nessi. Uh, let's go to our next question, and this will be uh, for Dr. Nessi. Uh, you demonstrated the grim reality of the economic state of patients undergoing cancer treatment, which is like basically a financial catastrophe for the whole family. You also referenced in your uh, presentation, which Dr. Trixie also uh, made uh, in her reaction, it was the study by Vivian Apostol that showed challenges in the Philippines were the following. Number one, there was lack of clear prioritization of resources within DOH for health promotions for cancer prevention. Number two, financing the distribution and delivery of vaccine products have been problematic. Can you elaborate more on her findings on why she ended up with these conclusions? And maybe those conclusions are no longer true. So uh, if you could answer, and I probably will have to I have Dr. Beverly respond to your answer after this. Dr. Nessie, go okay, ahead. Thank you. Um, actually, this is just a, a paper done by Apostol. Um, it's that there's no uh, screening program. So based also on the white paper, but uh, the DOH and the WHO, uh, um, they have this, uh, uh, the Manual of Operation for Organized Cancer Screening Program. Uh, Actually, it's um, it's ongoing. Um, so this is yung ito yung sagot na kulang na sinasabi ng paper na yon. So I think the the government is doing something. Uh, uh, we already have the CPG guidelines for uh, for screening program, the FIHEX guidelines by Dr. Atiyako. I think it's ito yung unang move. Uh, second is the organized cancer screening program of the DOH. So it's for hopefully for publication this year and hopefully for implementation for the next, uh, the plan is to to be implemented for the 10 years, I mean, to for the whole Philippines. Ano. Of course, part of this organized cancer screening program is financing of field health. Find, uh, because we have to include field health. Eh. We have to include 
uh, as part of the case rate um, screening program. And third, what else? Uh, the HPV vaccine or the vaccination. It, so pala, in terms of uh, just a suggestion for the screening, because we do a lot of awareness. The DOH is doing a National Cancer Awareness Month. That's every month. But after that, we don't know what the outcome. So it's, it's just a suggestion that we can publish. Like for this one, uh, we're doing this Awareness Month for TMC. A question is how many of uh, uh, na nanonood that they would do the screening? So at least we can have an outcome after this also. The same way with the the National Cancer Awareness Month of DOH. So that's one suggestion. Second, in terms of the vaccination, well, it's always the budget. It's, it's uh, we know that the vaccine is also expensive, especially for HPV. Um, uh, yun, uh, one is also the HTA, sabi nga ni Dr. Ho, na all vaccine, di ba, should go to the HTA. So it would take a lot of, hindi naman siguro a lot of time, but of course, there's always a process. Um, and because of the NICA law and we have a budget allocation for, for the screening and prevention, I think um, with Dr. Ho in the DOH, uh, kaya yan, kaya uh, ma-vaccinate kung ano man yung nangangailangan. So I, I think um, uh, in the next two to three years, um, cervical cancer will also, in terms of the numbers, will go down. Because we, most of the society now are moving towards uh, prevention and screening. So, nakita na nila yung importance na it's not more of the therapeutic, but more of the prevention and screening for cancer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nessi. Uh, Dr. Bev, are you familiar with that Vivian Apostol study and what are your uh, comments uh, based on uh, Dr. Nessi's answer? I think I wanted to probably ask the timing of the study, you know. Um, admittedly, um, there was really, um, I guess, underemphasis on primary care and prevention and even health promotion work um, prior to 2019. You know? And that's really why um, under the UHC Act, it was emphasized. Um, and in fact, um, health promotion um, in, under the law should be getting 1% of the DOH budget. Um, and we've been able to do that this year. And that's why you'll also see um, over the last um, three years during the pandemic, there was really a heightened, um, syempre, apart from the pandemic needs, no, there was really a heightened um, emphasis on health promotion. Um, Definitely, the most organized way to do cancer screening is when every Filipino actually has a primary care provider, di ba? And all our current efforts now, um, I know the PCS does a lot of outreach work uh, for cervical or breast cancer screening. And syempre, these are very, very laudable efforts. And we hope that this, um, in the future, the most sustainable way this will happen is when people really have a relationship with their local primary care provider. Um, that said, um, I completely agree with the points made by Ma'am Nessie. Um, and this is why there's funding that went into development of PHEX, di ba? Kasi nung sinabi primary care, mag-screen. Uh, ano ba to, no? Parang annual physical exam ba na screening yan? Or evidence-based din yung screening based on risk factors. And this is why these guidelines were actually developed. Now that the guidelines were developed, um, syempre, the next push will then be how to incorporate this um, into the benefit packages and how to continuously uh, capacitate our health workers no, on what is um, smart use of their resources, their time, their effort to screen versus um, those that are not cost-effective use of their time and effort to screen. Um, maybe um, the only other development I'd like to add is... Um, we do recognize with the budgets that we have now, we do recognize the need to invest better in not just health promotion, but primary care. No? So, but primary care will largely have to go through uh, PhilHealth, sinabi ni Ma'am. 
Pero yung isa pang route na nakikita namin in the interim is to work with civil society organizations. And um, I'm just happy to um, let everyone know that we've already also started a CSO accreditation route similar to some other government agencies. So nonprofit organizations typically cannot bid for DOH projects, but um, this um, CSO route hopefully will allow us to be able to channel some funds to um, non-government organizations to be able to do, um, sabi ni ma'am, no? follow up dun sa sinasabi nating health promotion, di ba? Kasi totoo naman, we can always tell people magpa-screen kayo, pero if the services, di dila na experience, parang words lang siya, no? So, if we're talking about, say, more, um, you know, itinerant vans going around, um, you know, just getting people to experience um, screening for the first time so they know the next time around this is what they will expect. Then hopefully this um, this um, vehicle of um, CSO accreditation will allow us to provide resources to groups like PCS, no, their NGO arm, um, to be able to do this more um, na hindi na constrain kung where to get the resources. So I, I guess this is something that we hope we can build on this year so that it's part of our budget proposal next year. Recognizing that, syempre, if we work only within the government instrumentality of, say, DOH, then baba namin yung money to uh, regional offices, then to um, LGUs, lahat may lag, no? may delay. And the NGOs can actually, as, as been shown in other countries, have uh, more... Um, ano ba tawag doon? Parang flexibility to do things faster um, and in a more agile manner. So, sorry sir, mahaba <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Bev. Uh, actually, I want to add something uh, what uh, Dr. Bev has emphasized, which is having a primary care provider. I actually, before I joined the medical city in 2014, I had worked at Kaiser Permanente sa California Puto for almost 10 years, and the backbone of the success of Kaiser Permanente is in their primary care providers. So these primary care providers make sure that they are on top of the health of their patients. So one of them is screening. So they, 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 they screen for cancer, but they screen also for good diabetes control, for hypertension control. So there is someone who's actually coordinating all the care, unlike here in the Philippines, in which uh, they go to different specialists, but they don't have a coordinator. So sometimes, you know, things fall into the cracks and they don't get screened for cancer. And next thing you know, they have stage four cancer. So I think this is what's good for the universal healthcare in which we empower our patients and our primary care providers in the health of each individual Filipino. So I would like to go to Dr. Trixi Chanko. Maybe if you could tell us, uh, our audience on the Scrap Cancer Program of the Medical City. Dr. Trixie? Sure, June. Um, you, you will see uh, in, in, in front of you the Scrap Cancer Now, or Scrap really stands for Screen and Prevent Cancer. Um, um, it, it, it's clearer now more than ever that we all need to screen uh, and prevent cancer. So I think that ha that was also emphasized uh, by all of our speakers today. So. We do have a program. We we are uh, working with uh, different LGUs. Uh, we have purchased a mobile screening breast cancer screening bus. We have a registry of people at risk for cancer. We are working with. Uh, yesterday we met for the first time with the Ateneo uh, School of uh, Institute for Philippine Culture. Sila Dr. Dennis Batangan. Uh, and and ayun na nga nabanggit ni Dr. Abel si mga civil serve civil society amaba civil society organizations marami uh, maraming gustong tumulong um, and uh, syempre lahat ko lang pera pero may konti naman yung mga mga <laughs> mga philanthropies meron pero so yun yung yun yung pwede namin, namin itap and now that Dr. Rabebs has mentioned that the DOH might be opening up to partnering with civil service organizations, um, that's certainly welcome news. And I'm sure a lot of people will be knocking on DOH's door. Um, I think one of the things that I've learned in the past years that we started advocacy work is 
there's a lot of people who really want to help, especially those who go through cancer with their patients or themselves. Uh, and you see the suffering, uh, it's hard not, not to want to help. So uh, again, the screen, Scrap Cancer Program, Screen and Prevent, uh, we're starting uh, with the PASIG LGU. We've talked with the mayors of PASIG and of San Juan. Um, we're going to partner also, we're talking with um, uh, Kara Magsano, uh, I Can Serve, they have the gig um, and other other um, other LGUs uh, where there are also other workers who want to help. So I hope I answered your question, Joe. Yeah, Dr. Trixie, thank you very much. Are there any specific cancer screen, screenable cancers that the scrap cancer would be first dealing with before expanding the right. uh, the cancers, Dr. Trixie? It, it's it's community based, no. That's why we have a mobile bus, so we will bring the bus. We will bring a screening bus. Um, of course, uh, priority will be breast because it's the most common cancer, uh, and it's screenable. Uh, we hope to be able to uh, include. We have a a, a bed for pap smear. Uh, so we can do pap smears and we'll be partnering with our Institute for Women's Health to go to the barangays to do pap smears. Uh, we are working with our IT so that we have a registry wherein we will be able to coordinate with the health municipal officers so that they can come up uh, with a list of all their uh, community members who are fall under uh, those at risk based on the clinical practice guidelines that we just the PX recently published on the screening for cancer. Uh, so it's going to be based on that. Um, and uh, we are going to be monitoring. We hope to be able to include fit tests, June. Please guide us. Uh, we want to be able to do screening uh, using fit. Uh, as Dr. Soliano said and Nessie, we cannot really afford colonoscopy uh, as, as the, the main screening uh, uh, procedure of choice, especially in the communities. Um, so uh, we'll be hopefully knocking at your door uh, and asking for your guidance and how we can do fit tests when we go to the communities, surrounding communities, and uh, why not? Everywhere else where a, a, a huge truck can go. Thank you, Dr. Trixie. Actually, she and I had some uh, conversations several months back as, as far as including uh, fit in that bus because uh, you the, the fit card is only this big so you just need to distribute it to the patients who are at risk and they could probably uh, return the card at the end of the day and we could bring it to our laboratory and they should be able to provide with the results you know within 24 hours however if you do have positive fits we need to be prepared. We can't just let, let them uh, be hanging. You know, if they have a fit positive card, what do you do next? So we should also be prepared that we can schedule colonoscopy for them. So as uh, Nessie said, uh, screening, you, there has to be certain features of a good screening program. It's not just distributing cards and then you don't know what to do after next. So we need to have a setup for uh, colonoscopy and if needed surgery and then chemo it has to be the whole spectrum like what is entailed in nika so and we are let me just let in, especially for breast uh, but um it's it's really just a matter of process and um uh, training uh the health uh, workers in the community to communicate with the navigators uh cancer navigators of the hospital um, of the different hospitals, but in, in this, this particular hospital, because it's a program, it's a scrap cancer program of the medical city, malinis na yung proseso. And it's really, really um, almost unethical for you to just do a screening test, number one, and not find, make sure you tell the results, whether it's positive or negative, especially it's positive, make sure someone navigates them, lets them know um, what, where to go and what to do, and sasamahan mo yan. Yan ang journey, yan ang role ng navigator. Akbay talaga, kasama mo talaga. And that is how our program was set up. Thank you, Dr. Trixie. Uh, we have a question here for Dr. Bev, and then we will entertain our online questions. So 
uh, for Dr. Bev, in the list of the designated six advanced comprehensive centers, I think this was in Metro Manila. They were all government hospitals, right? I think you 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 presented a slide in which you mentioned all the advanced uh, comprehensive centers and the basic centers. Uh, looking at the list, uh, obviously they were all government. They are all government hospitals. But in the future, can a high tech private hospital like the, the medical city? get a designation within NICA uh, as one of those advanced uh, uh, hospitals to cater to, uh, to patients with cancer. And if a patient hoping to be covered by NICA, can they freely choose to go to a, like a private hospital instead of a, a government hospital in the future? So uh, what, what, will we, what will we advise our patients on this, circ on this particular situation, Dr. Bev? Okay, thank you, sir. Um, I think this is really going to be limited by our government processes. No? So first of all, if they would want to seek um, private um, consult providers, um, the best government assistance you can give them is PhilHealth. Because PhilHealth can transfer to money, both public and private providers. For the Cancer Assistance Fund, because we're downloading cash, no, to the facilities and the facilities will have to be accountable to audit it etc currently it's really only um, government providers that are eligible to be cancer assistance funds so even our malasakit funds diba? and there's just really a special um, mou that we have with private facilities but that's parang reimbursable no? so unlike um, kapag government facilities the funds can be um, stationed there and parang nagbabawas lang sila, di ba? As for the um, CSP map, no, the the meds um, that we have. So clearly last year our challenge was um, we had delays, no, because we couldn't um, buy the meds from um, a facility or the Philippi Phil Pharma um, Incorporated, which helps. It's also a government entity that helps us procure. No? So this year, um, so kaya last year, we gave money to our hospital. So again, because it's money that we're downloading, only public facilities can get the downloaded money. Diba? So it's more audit purposes. No? Um, this year, for um, we'll go back no, to providing um, actual uh, in-kind commodities. No? So kapag in-kind commodities, as long as someone on the other side will be receiving, um, making sure and certifying that they've received um, such commodities that we are able to provide them. No? So kaya in fact, diba, even your private patients, when they get referred to um, DOH facilities, um, they can go no, to the pharmacy of the DOH hospital and claim the goods. Diba? So possible yun, no? kasi we're giving the actual medicines. So, in short, sir, to answer your question, um, home for these non phil health benefits, um, likely, you know, they will largely be accessible in public facilities because of our auditing guidelines. Um, but we're hoping that we can work better for my networks, yung private facilities. So, I don't know, kunwari, TMC, no, pinakamalapit siya sa anong DOH hospital, di ba? QMMC bayan or something, no? So, Maybe you can work um, together on a network na between, um, so from our end, from the central office level, syempre ang co-work namin yung DOH hospital, di ba? Pero this does not preclude that the DOH hospital works with you in your network. Uh, meron kayong way of accounting, no? Okay, mag-iwan ba sila ng certain men sa inyo, etc. or papalitan, no? So, these are things that flexible at the level of the DOH hospitals, but at the central level, we don't micromanage these things, di ba? So, kaya parang important, no, ngayon na, um, syempre from, for accounting purposes, accountable sa amin yung DOH hospitals, di ba? So, as long as they will have a structure na walang mawawalang gamot, everything is accounted for, lahat may pangalan ng tao kung sino yung nakakuha ng gamot, okay tayo, di ba? So, these flexibilities on the ground are allowed under the NICA and we're hoping that, kaya sabi din, di ba, kanina pa ulit-ulit this year, it's collaboration. Kasi, the resources, uh, they're not enough still, no? But it's significantly better than what we've had three, four years ago. Um, the question now is, 
how do we become flexible at the same time accountable at the implementation level? Because those flexibilities are technically no allowed, um, allowed. So, basa magtutulongan lang yung facility to facility. After all, I mean, it's the same providers, de ba? Our um, oncologists who work in some of our government hospitals also work in the private hospital. So, yun lang. Siguro, uh, kailangan lang din natin maging uh, mas um, creative on how we can work together as long as we follow the government rules. Thank you, Pa. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Someone's man. also asking. Someone's also asking if ano daw, if if the NICA will also cover OFW. Shempre di ba? Kasama yung OFW. Filipinos pa rin naman sila, so they should be covered. Uh, I think uh, there's a question here which I will address na kay Dr. Trixie. Uh, how can we make uh, colon cancer screening now more appealing to the average Filipino? at the barangay level and to solicit much more participation nationwide. Should it be institutionalized in the workplace, Dr. Trixie? I think um, your video that you're going to show <laughs> is, is going to be helpful <laughs> in terms of making the exam, which has to do with stools and which has to do mm -hmm. with the colon, more appealing. I think it has to do also with understanding the psyche of any human being because it's really a, a challenge, right? Uh, everywhere in the world, mm -hmm. but also here, um, how to handle your stool specimen. That's why some people, as Dr. Solano said, prefer colonoscopy to doing a much less expensive mm -hmm. uh, fit test. No? Um, so uh, that's a difficult question and an age-old question. Uh, but I think more and more, uh, uh, it, it's it's uh, more and more appealing. As hopefully the cartoon that June will show later on uh, will show us. Uh, the other thing I, I will sing it now. What I wanted to to uh, mention after Dr. Bebs uh, said, um, kailangan more creative sabi -sabi in um, and accountable. Cakak kailangan din Dr. Siguro mas disciplined ang practitioners uh, in listing down uh, the names no? and, and in the process. It requires talaga sticking to a process. We're not used to that kasi eh. Uh, bago lang to sa atin. And even in medical school, siguro kailangan medical school pa lang. Itong mga programa na napakaganda, uh, na hopefully talagang ma-establish na with today's DOH, turuan na natin yung medical student kung paano maging tunay na doktor ng bayan. Uh, so, so yun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Trixie. Isa pa. Okay. Um, just a follow-up kay Dr. Weber Lijo regarding the CS map. And uh, because I also practice in the government hospital, the national team, and we are designated as advanced and part of the CS map. So, so yung mga gamot, tama na if a patient comes, not within the hospital. So we also give them the medicine. So this is to help other patients, not within NKDI and other doctors. Basta ayos lang yung aming uh, uh, paperwork. So, so it's not only for government, but uh, kung medicine talaga, we can help also private patients and private hospitals. Tsaka mag-digital transformation na. Um, kasi kung paperwork yan, things get lost. Um, errors are made. But we really need, um, it's really all of society, hindi lang doctors, hindi lang healthcare, pati IT. Um, kailangan uh, level up na tayong lahat. Uh, so, yun. Lang. So we'll, we'll have to have another meeting with Dr. Ho after this, ma'am. For the... <laughs> for the IT and the uh, inventory of uh, meds. So it's easier na parang may magpo-prank upos na tong isang ano to. Tas kanina na punta. So I think that's another program for June Ruiz. Uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the pathways. Uh, I mean it's uh, uh, establishing a good pathways for medicine access program. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Nancy. Uh, maybe we'll move on to the next question. And this is actually from Dr. Eric Tayag of the Department of Health. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Eric, for watching us. So, yung question ni Dr. Eric is actually for Dr. Soliano, but we'll try to answer the question nilang of Dr. Eric. And the, the question is, there are reports that adults 40 years old and below have colorectal cancer. Should we lower the age for colonoscopy? So, very good question, Dr. Eric. Uh, since Dr. Soliano is not here, so I will answer this question. So we have to basically differentiate whether are we doing the colonoscopy for screening or are we doing it for diagnostic reasons because they do have uh, like rectal bleeding, they do have symptoms. And definitely over the last uh, decade or so, there has been increase in incidence of colon cancer in the young. And we actually considered colon cancer in the young as patients who are age 50 and below. And the most uh, common, uh, uh, the most popular uh, cancer, uh, colon cancer patient that was in the news a couple of years ago was the Avengers star Chadwick Boseman. Actually, he will be in that uh, video that we will be showing. And uh, in the US, they actually have lowered the age from 50 to 45 because of the increased incidence of uh, colon cancer uh, among Americans. But in the Philippines, it's still 50 years old because number one, uh, colon cancer is partly genetic in uh, causation and Americans really have a higher incidence of colon cancer than Filipinos. And number two, you also uh, have to make sure that you have enough resources to do early screening. And right now we don't even have a colon ca national colorectal cancer screening program, which we should start for age 50. So how can you lower the age when there's actually no cancer screening program uh, nationally that's already in place? So, but if you have a patient who do have symptoms, so we're talking about rectal bleeding and you're concerned that they may, be, they may have cancer, then you should do the colonoscopy at any age if indicated. But if you're just saying we want to screen, I don't have any symptoms, but I'm scared that I may, I may have cancer, uh, if you're only like 35 years old, it may not be, you know, uh, uh, cost effective and it, the doctor may not doing uh, a patient a favor if they would do that because there are also risks for a colonoscopy and you don't want to create a problem in a patient in which there was no problem to begin with. So, but I guess the short answer is you could do colonoscopy less than the screening age as long as it's not for screening. Okay. So I hope uh, uh, I was able to answer the question of Dr. Eric. So do we have any more questions from our audience? Uh, I think, was well, there something about breast cancer or, or okay, I, okay. I think, uh, yeah, we, we don't have any more questions. Uh, we still have a, a video lecture to follow after this, but I would like to uh, congratulate all our speakers and reactor for giving excellent talks. And I think people in our audience, our patients and physicians are able to learn a lot from your lectures. And we do have our, I guess, some token of appreciation from our speakers. So we have Dr. Beverly Ho there, Professor Soliano, and Dr. Nessie Huat. And, oh, that's me. <laughs> so there's a fourth caricature. And Dr. Trixie, yours should be coming. Uh, it wasn't, they weren't able to finish yours, but yours should be coming soon. So again, I would like to thank Dr. Trixie Chanko, Dr. Nessie Huat, Dr. Beverly Ho, and Professor Jose Soliano, who, who is in Denmark at this time, for taking the time to be with us from their busy schedules. Okay, thank you very Bye. much. Thank you. Have a video you. Hello. Thank you, Paul. Thank, thank, thank you. you. I hope you will, we were able to learn a lot from that uh, video lecture. And uh, if you have any questions about the presentation, please email your questions to colorectalclinic at themedicalcity.com. That lecture concludes our webinar, and I am glad that you opened your computers and cell phones to watch us learn about colon cancer. Uh, definitely colorectal cancer screening is a life-saving measure that all Filipinos should be offered and convinced to undergo. Thank you very much to our viewers for supporting us today. There's a long list that I would like to acknowledge for the success of this webinar.
I would like to thank all our speakers and reactors, Dr. Nessie Huwat, Assistant Secretary Dr. Bev Ho, Dr. Trixie Tianco, Professor Jose Soliano, our partner, the Department of Health, uh, the Office of Dr. Vergere, and the staff of Dr. Beverly Ho, especially Mr. Joram Saria, the Medical City, APSI, the Section of Gastroenterology, Colorectal Center, the TMC Strategic and Business Development Group, especially the Communication and the Marketing Departments, PAM and Cyril, the Medical City Network of Hospitals, TMC Clark, Pangasinan, South Luzon, Iloilo, and Guam, Diagnostica Filipinas, especially Mr. Chris Platon and Lamberto Peñaronda, and of course, for providing the best quality of production to our webinar, Sarion Films, Blake, Gail, Ariane, and everybody here. Again, this is Dr. June Ruiz, the lead of colorectal cancer screening of the Medical City, wishing you a wonderful weekend and signing off. Bye.